Hello and welcome to Access Rhode Island. My name is Kate Brewster and I'm the Executive Director of the Economic Progress Institute and host of this week's program. Rhode Island's population has always been diverse and today Latinos are growing in Rhode Island as they are across the country. Here to talk about the challenges and opportunities facing Latinos in Rhode Island is Ana Cana Morales, the Director of the Latino Policy Institute at Roger Williams University. Thank you for being here, Ana. Thank you for having me, Kate. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, it's a pleasure to have you. Um, before we talk about the specifics, can you just talk a little bit about the Institute and its mission, um, how long you've been around, sure. a little commercial for us all? Yes, thank you. We always <laughs> appreciate those opportunities. The Latino Policy Institute at Roger Williams University is um, an organization, nonprofit organization that's embedded in the university. Uh, it's been around for six years. It was an independent organization and now it's part of the, the university formally three years ago. And its mission is really to create reports and research on Latinos in Rhode Island so we can better be understood, engaged, and uh, fully accepted into the general population. <laughs> Excellent. Um, and you've been director for how not long now? A year and a half. A year and a half. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. So we, I mentioned in the introduction, like many um, states, Rhode Island is experiencing a growth in the Latino population. And Latinos are going to play an increasingly important role in our workforce, in our economy. Can you just talk a little bit about demographics? What have we seen over the past several years? What are the trends? What are the big takeaways? Yeah, I'm glad you asked that because I, I get asked all the time, why Latinos? Why does the Latino Policy Institute or Roger Williams focus on that population? It is the fastest growing demographic in the state and in the country, quite honestly. Mm -hmm. And so in over a decade's time, from 2000 to 2010, we saw a 53% increase in Latinos in Rhode Island alone. Wow. We are a little over 138,000 in numbers and growing steadily. So about 13% of the population. 13% of the population and climbing. Mm -hmm. uh, it's predicted that we will certainly grow steadily as the years go by. And we're extremely young, which is a very important takeaway. Uh, the median age is 26 compared to the overall Rhode Island median age of 40. Wow. So we're, you know... Uh, half the size, <laughs> half the age of, of average Rhode Islander has a, a lot of implications for program development, for policies, and for the way that we engage the community. Yes, um, and very interesting statistics when you drill down, uh, which we're going to talk some more about. Mm -hmm. So you all have issued a number of reports and publications that have garnered a lot of attention in the media, among policymakers, mm -hmm. opinion leaders, um, focus on housing, workforce, uh, the workforce, and education. Uh, you just had an op-ed that was published it in the was. Providence Journal last yeah. week that yeah. we all read uh, about the education challenges that Latinos are facing. So school started, so mm -hmm. um, let's talk about education first. What were right. some of the highlights from last year's report? Right, last August we released a report, the Latino students um, in Rhode Island, and it was a national uh, comparison study that looked at NAEP scores, so our students, our Latino students, uh, compared to their peers in the country. And what we found, unfortunately, is that our, our students fared really poorly. Mm -hmm. um, and we not only fared poorly across the country, when, when compared across the country, but also within our state. Mm -hmm. um, we, the average to two to two and a half grades behind their peers. Uh, certainly the achievement gaps are the worst, some of the worst in the country. And so we find that the systems that are educating uh, the students mostly in the urban districts, Providence, Pawtucket, and Central Falls, um, really have some changing to do mm -hmm. in order to really meet all the needs of all the students in their schools. We found that three out of four students in those three districts are Latino. Mm -hmm. um, so there is um, a high uh, number of English language learners, but there's just a high number of diversity. Right. And so we look at the classroom and who's in it. Um, we also look at the lack of diversity in the workforce mm -hmm. in education, one to three percent. Uh, of Latinos are in the education field. That's, that's troublesome because we want our students to grow up to know that they too can be teachers. They too can be social workers in a school. They too can be DARE officers or principals. But if they don't see that around them, it's difficult for them to dream that. So you offered a number of recommendations and part of the op-ed I think was reporting on how the state and some of the local governments and education boards are doing with implementing those. So right. talk, can you talk about a few of them? Yeah, we were, we've been very pleased at how Rhode Island has really, because it's really not just about Latino students, it's right. about Rhode Island right. um, and our education system. Um, we've been very pleased at how Rhode Island has rallied around recommendations. Um, we did recommend that Rhode Island re-envision its ELL, English Language Learner Instruction or strategies for really closing the achievement gap for that 
population. Mm -hmm. um, we also um, recommended that we recruit and do some work with our institutions of higher ed to ensure that we have a pipeline, a steady pipeline um, in the schools of education and other schools, other disciplines in the science and math and engineering fields. Um, and then we also looked at personalizing the instruction to ensure that students um, are learning skills that are adaptable in careers that are going to be um, uh, emerging emerging mm -hmm. careers because it is all about economic development mm -hmm. this is our future in our present workforce mm -hmm. and so we don't want another group of people to be left out like they have been left out when the manufacturing field um, really went to zero in, in or very close to zero in Rhode Island the largest group as you know because we studied this together um, that was affected by that were Latino workers mm -hmm. uh, in the factories yep. and so um, those were just some of our recommendations we've been very pleased um, there have been resources that have been targeted specifically at looking at partnerships between higher education institutions like Rhode Island College, mm -hmm. like Roger Williams University, working with school districts like Central Falls and Providence Public Schools to look very specifically at mathematics and Latino students. So that was one of our recommendations was that we, ta we target resources and that we're intentional about equity in education. And equity in education does include how resources are being awarded absolutely and so we've been very proud of uh, the work of the the report um, just even a short for only a year uh, a real eye-opener yeah. and I think a real call to action yeah. uh, that could not be ignored mm -hmm. I happen I remember in the op-ed you talked a little bit about some of the um, work that your Central Falls is doing around absenteeism which is happening in different yeah. parts of the state can right. you just talk a little bit about you're a member of the Central Falls School Board you're the chair yeah, I, I should am, say I'm the chair um, and what's yeah. happening in that community very proud to tell you that the Central Falls High School Alumni Association that has recently been formed just this past year um, has taken that on as a challenge for themselves as graduates successful young professionals here in Rhode Island mm -hmm. and many who are still living in Central Falls or P Pawtucket right next door um, have taken it to the streets and they're uh, evangelizing the importance um, to, to, to be able to, to come to school every day on time prepared and the importance of education in their lives and so they are almost peer-to-peer -peer taking on uh, family by family mm -hmm. we identified over 400 families wow. uh, and this summer for o over a three-week span um, home visits were made with um, professionals from the school district with family school liaisons wow. social workers teachers uh, parents uh, knocked on doors and um, really addressed families in a culturally responsive way, linguistically appropriate way, and in a, in a, in a friendly way. Mm -hmm. Not in a punitive, you're a bad kid, you're a bad parent for not making mm -hmm. sure that your child goes to school on time or every day, but hey, what's going on? We noticed, you know, last year's records told us that your child was absent 37 days. Mm -hmm what's the problem mm -hmm. how can we help you mm -hmm. maybe it's an asthma situation maybe it's a situation where a child has um, some emotional issues maybe the family is going through a crisis and needs support or a parent works third shift I mean, there's <laughs> exactly. so many reasons that we hear exactly. about as to why kids can't get to school on time and then it's not on time yeah. oftentimes they just don't come right. Um, so it's some great work that you're doing up there yeah. and that's directly related to the report again because um, 28% of the students in Central Falls are chronically absent. Wow. And at the high school, 51% wow. are chronically absent. Wow. So talk about targeting a very specific issue that has a lot to do with whether or not our kids are successful or that community is successful. Yep. And the community feeling empowered to do something about it. Excellent. Well, it's very exciting work that's going on in Thank Central you. Falls. Um, when it comes to education, we know that it's not just about Latino kids, right. but also about adults. Right. Uh, we had looked at the workforce, the Latino workforce last Labor Day. Right. Um, <laughs> and we know that by 2020, all of the growth of the working age population in Rhode Island is going to be among Latinos. And right. in fact, I think it was la the Latino working age population was going to grow by 5% while the non-Latino was going to shrink by right. 5%. So right. they're critically important to the future of our state. Yeah, we're actually growing success. a little bit faster, 5.6%. Wow. Yeah, uh, absolutely. And so it behooves us all <laughs> to start cre thinking about what is it that we're going to do to prepare our workforce for tomorrow mm -hmm. and for the jobs of today and tomorrow? How are we going to, if, we, if manufacturing is going to come back in Rhode Island, and we've heard a lot of candidates who are running for office say that, that, that that's their, they're going to be the right. goal of priority, how are we going to prepare our students and our adults to ensure that they have access to those jobs? Right. Um, and wages have everything to do with whether or not 
uh, you're successful in a community and then you're able to invest in home ownership or you're investing in a, in a vehicle or in higher education for yourself and your children. And so looking at high, pay, high, pay, high paying jobs is very, very important. Um, there's also a need for our population, especially our adult uh, population, to have access to higher education, mm -hmm. to credentialing, to certificate programs, to you know really a ladder of opportunities um, through a variety of occupations. Yep. Um, that needs to start early, but for those uh, adults that we have here now, you know, we're missing an opportunity if we're not fully engaging them because they're very productive workers, as you know. We're working just as uh, as hard and as much as Rhode Islanders, uh, non-Hispanic Rhode Islanders. 65% is our workforce participation rate, uh, rate compared to 66%. So right. we're right there neck to neck with you. We right. want to work. Right. Uh, we want to be given the opportunity to be productive and right. we want to be self-sufficient. And actually, we know from the report that most Latinos were, um, speak English either exclusively or very well. Right. Um, and it's actually maybe a quarter who, who don't meet those two benchmarks. Um, but we also know that Latinos do, there, there is a higher share than the non-Latino population that don't have a high school credential, right. which is just a, a baseline right. um, that folks need to get to now to get a decent job, right. um, let alone get the credentials. We still have waiting lists. Um, mm -hmm. for people to get into basic education, to get into the English mm -hmm. language um, classrooms. That seems to be issue number one. Right. Right? We, have, we have to diversify our portfolio. We have got to diversify. We have to, just like a, a, a business person would diversify their investments, so should the state of Rhode Island mm -hmm. when it comes to workforce and skill development. So yes, there's absolutely the need for the basic education that gets you a GED, mm -hmm. that gets you basic English classes, that mm -hmm. gets you citizenship classes. Mm -hmm. right. right. Right? But then there's also the specialized, the need for specialized um, uh, language attainment related to a career field or a job. Absolutely. So if you're going to be working for Lifespan or you're going to be working for a company that's in the health industry, you know, th those, uh, those English classes or that, that program should be tailored to the vocabulary of that industry. Um, very simple. It seems pretty basic. Yep. And then we also need to fund it appropriately and we, we need to secure the, 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 the appropriate resources, not just for the program, but also who's offering the program. Right. Where are the programs the offered? High quality programs, absolutely. I know the Governor's Workforce Board will soon be releasing a report that shows um, where we need to be making investments in workforce training. Um, there was a bill last year that would have funded the basic ed enough to eliminate waiting lists. It mm -hmm. just seems like in a state that's struggling, right. and we know, as you said, education is so closely tied right. to wages right. and to a state's economic success right. that we should be doing everything we can to lift all populations right. up, and Latinos being the growing part of the workforce, it's just critical. Right. Um, we know that um, the income of Latinos is uh, low, much lower, the, the median income, household income, than, than whites. Mm -hmm. um, and tomorrow there'll be some new census data that comes out about mm -hmm. poverty. We know Latino poverty rates are much higher. Mm -hmm. um, I think one of the interesting things we found in the workforce report was the rate that are working voluntarily, uh, involuntarily mm -hmm. part-time. Right. Um, and some of the other statistics that we found where we know Latinos want to work, as you said, but they're, they're not able to find full-time work as easily. Right, exactly. Facing some of those challenges. Exactly. Um, and, and part of it, I, th I do think it's, it's access to these jobs, access to the skills, access to the language uh, related to the jobs. Um, and then there's, there's also um, the ability to be able to navigate the systems that are able to offer people opportunities for employment or higher education or credentialing. It's off, sometimes it's the system itself that's daunting right. to be able to, to, to have access to. Right. Well, we talked a little bit about how um, Rhode Island, people I don't think realize this, has lost the largest share mm. of manufacturing jobs since the 1990s mm -hmm. in the country mm -hmm. as a share of our total employment. Mm -hmm. And we know Latinos were twice as likely to right. work in that sector. Right. Um, and so today, we've seen Latinos actually, through the data, mm -hmm. be able to start their own businesses. Yeah. Um, do you want to share some of those yes. statistics? As a matter of fact, we saw a 69% um, increase in small businesses, Latino-owned small businesses, between 2002 and 2007. And that tells us that Latinos are very entrepreneurial, very resourceful, and they have great ideas. Mm -hmm. And they're able to really um, become very uh, engaged in economic development. And it, quite honestly, it's, it's very uh, characteristic of Rhode Island, because mm -hmm. Rhode Island is considered a small business state. Um, Latinos 
fit right into that characteristic. Um, mm -hmm. If you go up and down several of the main streets, particularly in our urban cities like Providence, like Central Falls or Pawtucket, you'll notice that there are salons, there are um, clinics, there are restaurants, there are bakeries, uh, there are party stores. Um, absolutely, they're entrepreneurial. They need to be given access to capital. They need to be given the right um, advice and mm -hmm. counsel when they're putting t their business plans together. And I think there's a role for the business community. Yep. There's a role for chambers to play in ensuring that they are engaging um, all businesses, all business owners, right. big and small. Right. And, uh, and yeah, that's very promising. I think also just to touch on the um, credentialing co companies to be minority owned businesses, which is a daunting process, we know. So streamlining some of that, making sure that Latinos and other populations, women, are able to become certified mm -hmm. um, to get some of those contracts exactly. that have not historically been awarded to those groups. Right. When you're looking at the contracts, particularly the state contracts, um, there are a very small short list mm -hmm. of vendors who actually do work with the state. And how do we increase that? How do we target that specifically uh, to ensure that women-owned businesses and Latino or minority-owned businesses uh, really do have um, equal opportunity, mm -hmm. really, to the truest sense of, that, of those two words, equal opportunity, uh, to be able to compete? Yep, absolutely. Yeah. Um, speaking of equal opportunity, housing has housing. just been another incredibly yeah. um, difficult area for all Rhode Islanders. I mean, the cost of housing here is very high. Wages have been stagnant. Mm -hmm. Everyone is, is um, suffering, really, with right. the high cost of housing. But Latinos really yeah. um, have, have had a hard time. Can you talk about some of the work yes, you've done there? Yes, that partnership was with Housing Works Rhode Island, um, similar to the partnership that we had with uh, Economic Progress Institute. We actually looked at housing affordability mm -hmm. for Latinos in Rhode Island, and we found that it's not very affordable mm -hmm. uh, for Latinos to live here, yet they're here. Um, and uh, the wages, it's all tied to low wages. So the median income for Rhode Island uh, renter household is $30,000. Um, and then uh, compare that to $54,000 um, to be able to afford uh, an apartment or housing in Rhode Island. It, they're paying more than 50% uh, of their income. Mm. Uh, many are paying f more than 55% of their income. Yep. And so um, it's just not affordable, not attainable. 71% of Latinos in Rhode Island are renters. Uh, as a matter of fact, just on the way over here, I... Um, I bumped into somebody that's well known, and they said we, they were looking through the Twitter feed, and they said I had no, we had no idea, and we're like, yeah, there's 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 a huge income wage gap yeah. uh, for the Latino community, and then there are Latinos like me, professionals who have college degrees, who are making a decent salary or middle class salary, and we're able to be homeowners, mm -hmm. but. There are others who are not. How do, we, how do we make those bridges so we're able to really have more of an equitable distribution of resources? And I think, you know, you think about economic development and what the state's trying to achieve and grow, um, making sure that people can afford homes, can afford child care, transportation. Right. As you point out in that report, the more money that people can spend in the economy, right. that's what's going to, you know, the economy right. is consumer driven. Right. And, um, but people here really are stuck kind of paying for the basics. Right. We found that there's approximately $82 million that it's not being invested in our local economy mm -hmm. by Latinos mm -hmm. specifically because of the lack of affordability, the cost burden yep. uh, that, that Latinos have living in Rhode Island. That's $82 million that could be invested in college classes, karate lessons for the children in terms of enrichment, mm -hmm. tutoring services, um, putting down a, a deposit in your first home, right. which is the American dream. Right. Um, there's, there's the investment that's not happening in a lot of our businesses um, because our Latinos don't have enough to really m make ends meet. Yep. Um, there isn't any resources left in order to be reinvested in the community. Right. So lots to be done. Yeah. Um, given some of those um, uh, statistics and findings, what is on the Latino Policy Institute's agenda, or what do you think are some yeah. public policy institutes, public policy recommendations, excuse right. me, that could really make a difference, right. whether it's education, housing, workforce, Right. You name it. Well, right now what's on the horizon, what we've been studying um, a little bit more closely, and we may um, dive in 
uh, to do some research uh, and analysis in the next year or so, is looking at college access for Latinos mm -hmm. and um, persistence, college persistence. So not just are Latinos getting into college, but are they successful your four years later, later with a college mm -hmm. degree? Mm -hmm. And what are some of the recommendations we can make as a policy institute to institutions of higher education um, and K through 12 systems that are producing students um, to ensure that they have every opportunity to be successful at the end of their college um, career. So we're looking at college persistence and Latinos specifically. That's something that I think um, will be a project of ours next year. Um, in terms of other policy recommendations, anything that our, our state leaders do in terms of economic development has to include this fast growing population. It's not good enough to say that we're going to float all boats. Mm -hmm. You need a specific plan mm -hmm. for a, a very specific population that is very diverse within its diversity. Right. And so being well-versed in that, and if you're not well-versed in that, you need to surround yourself with people who are well-versed with those research and, and policy recommendations right. to ensure that you're really leading for all of Rhode Island. Right. We talked a little bit before we started about um, child care mm. and the fact that the Latino population is so young. Um, you and I know how, afford, how expensive child care yes. is. And Rhode Island's cut back tremendously. Right. And it hasn't just affected the kids and the families, right. um, but the Latino workforce, actually, um, many of the women in the community were providing care in their homes. They were mm -hmm. licensed daycare providers. Many of those doors were closed right. over the past few years or right. decade because of the cutbacks made at the state level. Mm -hmm. How important is child oh, yeah. care? Well, it's, it's important for two main reasons, mm -hmm. and I think the main reasons are academically uh, and um, certainly child well-being tells us, all the research around child well-being tells us that there is a huge... Um, uh, incentive for communities to invest in early child education programs, high quality early child education programs and child care programs because they help enrich the academic development of youngsters, mm -hmm. right? Our kids mm -hmm. need that. Um, secondly, it's an economic development strategy. Right. If you are a young family and you have two young children and both um, mom or dad or two, two adults in the family are able to go out and work, um, it's it's necessary to have an affordable child care um, available to you. And so it's not a welfare program. It's an economic development strategy to get people to work. Uh, sometimes people are not working because they, they don't have anywhere to leave their children. Sometimes it's not because they don't have a job. I personally have known people who have refused a job because they don't have the, abil the ability to pay for high-quality child care. Right. So it's not worth them working because they're going to spend 80% of their salary on right. child care. So yeah, the child care subsidy is, is, a big, is a big policy that I hope gets revisited. Yes, well, we'll be working on that, and we'll look forward to working with you mm -hmm. on that as well. Um, let's just take a few minutes. We just had a primary election, <laughs> and we'll have a general election in a few weeks. Yeah. Um, what role did Latinos play in the election? I think they played uh, a large role, um, certainly in the urban cities. Um, we saw an uptake in registered, new registered voters, particularly in the city of Central Falls. Mm -hmm. I think that they're riding on the curtails of a bright future and new leadership. I think they're energized and inspired by what they see in Mayor Diosa and his administration. Um, I think they um, are finding it um, good to be civically engaged. And so seeing that uptick was really promising. Eight per they had the highest yes. new registration in Central Falls. Exactly, 8%. 8%. Um, which is huge. Yeah. It's huge. Um, and also, um, I think, you know, some, we had, you know, three candidates, um, two running for statewide office, um, one running for governor, the other one running for lieutenant governor. And, you know, winners or losers, whatever they are, they're all winners because they have busted through cultural ceilings that have, um, have been around for a long, long time. So they've made history in one way or another. And certainly when you have a very young population kind of aspiring to, to, to look through the future, it's good to see somebody uh, like an Angel Taveras run for governor or Nelly Gobert run for lieutenant governor. Again, regardless of their, their outcome or their campaigns, they're making, uh, they're trailblazing and making history. So, Absolutely. Yeah. And I know one of the things the Institute cares deeply about is getting people engaged and, mm -hmm. and participating in democracy and how important that is. Yeah. Um, and I know you, you all are promoting that all the time. And we are. Um, because um, 
conversations and discussions around policy really should be informed um, conversations. That's part of the mission of Latino Policy Institute is to make sure that we're creating uh, nonpartisan, credible data that we can share with anybody mm -hmm. who's interested in learning more and, and being much more informed about Latinos. And having that civic participation really be informed. Uh, it's very important for us because I think it's not just about Latinos, it's about Rhode Island. It really is. Um, tell me, uh, how do people find out more about the Institute? How are you funded? Um, and do you go out and speak? Or right. how, how would people get engaged if they uh, want to learn more? People can always uh, go to the Roger Williams University website, mm -hmm. rwu.org. Uh, edu, mm -hmm. um, and then you can also um, type in LPI or Latino Policy Institute. My email address is a morales at rwu.edu. I'm very accessible, uh, probably one of the most accessible people, <laughs> <laughs> too accessible. <laughs> um, and so they're always uh, welcome to call me or to give me an email. Uh, we're funded through, originally we were funded through Hispanics and Philanthropy, which was a national funding collaborative that looked at building the capacity of Latino organizations. Uh, and that was a collaborative that Rhode Island was in collaboration with uh, Massachusetts. Back, back then it was through the Rhode Island Foundation. Mm -hmm. um, and we also have received grants from the Annie Casey Foundation as well as the United Way of Rhode Island in the past. Uh, and we're supported heavily by the Roger Williams University, mm -hmm. which is, uh, is, a, is a great thing. Excellent. And yeah. I assume you take private donations if people we want to. We do take private donations. <laughs> we take uh, corporate sponsorships if they want to sponsor one of our infographics or one of our briefs uh, or an event that we may have in the future. Excellent. Any parting words um, that you'd like to mention? or? No, I just wanted to say thank you for partnering with Latino Policy Institute uh, last year. I think that was a great piece of work that we did together. I think we were able to amplify the story, each other's story. Yes. Uh, you looking at economics and wages and us looking at Latinos and how that intersects with the work that you do. And so the more that we can build off on those partnerships and that model of working together, the better. Well, every Rhode Islander should care deeply about what is happening to communities of color, mm -hmm. Latinos, African Americans. Um, we're all in this together. Mm -hmm. We all share... Um, a deep desire to get our state moving again, mm -hmm. and everybody has an important role to play. Um, I just want to take the last minute, maybe, to um, mention that there were some big changes with the Right Care program this mm -hmm. year. I was just going to give a little commercial. Okay. Um, where families are, um, are going to have to engage in a new enrollment process, where before they had had to um, get they would normally get something in the mail and send it back. Well, today families are being asked to enroll online. Mm -hmm. um, and so I just want to let the audience know that if you are receiving right care, uh, if you have been for the past year or for at least a year, uh, keep your eyes out for some mail that will come telling you how to renew your right care health insurance. Um, it's a new way of doing business. And the best thing to do is probably to call the number that's on the uh, piece of paper, you can call the contact center at the Health Source RI um, and have somebody help walk you through that application so that you don't lose your health insurance. We know that lots of families have not gotten through that process and are being um, taken off mm -hmm. of their health insurance just at a time yeah, no. when we're trying to get everybody enrolled. Many thousands, of, actually, of people are coming off because mm -hmm. of this new system. Things always take time mm -hmm. to get used to, and we know that sometimes online systems can be a little challenging at first. But mm -hmm. um, please, if you are receiving right care and you get that notice in the mail, uh, pay particular attention and call the number. So I just want to end the program by thanking Anna. I look sure. forward to working with you in the coming year on many issues. There are so many. There's so many. Um, it's hard <laughs> to know which ones to prioritize, but again, it's really great to have Latino Policy Institute now Thank you. Um, providing terrific data. Uh, that really is what should be driving policy. Uh, it's so important. So thank you, Anna, for being here. Thank you, here. Kate. My pleasure. And we'll see you next time. <laughs>